My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. And hello there. We're back. Uh, Thank you for tuning in or watching to the David Summerfleck podcast. My guest today is Josh Hamilton. Josh, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks, man. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Every day is a blessing, Uh, especially with all the craziness going on in the world today. Let's start with your own background, your particular education, and your own launching point because one of the reasons why i wanted to interview you in the first place is because i thought that you were a really interesting guy and you have this really broad mix of topics on your own podcast chatter and on your own website the gist so could you get started with that and then kind of segue into you know what's this all about i thought it was really really interesting well I mean, like the the podcast itself started when I was, I lived in in London, Ontario for quite a, for for basically a year. Um, And I was working for this little magazine that was doing pieces on all the little independent small businesses in the, in the city and just like telling their story, which was, which a really cool way to get to know the city. Actually, I found loads of like really amazing places that I wouldn't have found otherwise because of it. But so I, I would have to go and do interviews with the with all the, the owners of the businesses. And this was like the first time that I had ever like had to do an interview with people and like ask them questions about their business, about like things from like loads of different angles that I, you know, maybe never even thought about. I was talking to like chocolatiers or people making maple syrup. And then we were talking to people running like secondhand shops or there was one woman who was like a small business like mogul but she did like axe throwing so we ended up talking about that for ages um anyway so i started doing these interviews and then um i was recording them to then listen to them back later to to write the article and and i was like you know if i put a bit more work into like the presentation and stuff then i'm pretty sure that this could make a pretty fun podcast and uh, unfortunately the i didn't i didn't stay there beyond the years the idea never really went anywhere but then I heard this just stunning podcast with um, Joe Rogan, Brett Weinstein, and Jordan Peterson all together. And I had my mind blown that people could have conversations of this type and of that length and of that depth. And I was really inspired to, to kind of start my own podcast and, and wanted the, the theme to be that, that I could talk to, to people about, about anything just that I find interesting because and ultimately, and quite selfishly, that's that's all it's about. It's about um, me talking to people about stuff that I find interesting. Yeah, same here with me. So how did you get started with the gist? Because what struck me about it was it seemed like the, you were talking about international or global politics, really, uh, from a different perspective because it's not just news per se uh but more trends and i thought that that was very unique so how did that get started and i mean did you have a history previously in international global trends or politics or what was that I mean, I've always found um, American politics to be to be quite fascinating. Like it's uh, it's it's theater, and it's the, the yeah. biggest stage in the world, um, and it's 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 a it's a powerful influence on the rest of the world in terms of culture and in terms of of, of politics. So it's uh, it's kind of difficult to ignore, and and I always kind of find like world affairs um, intriguing, and then. 
I guess I just I find American politics really really fascinating, and 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 I also find that a lot of the things that happen in America are either mirrored at the same time in Britain or maybe five years down the line, ten years down the line, and in that way it can kind of act as um, for me like a canary in the coal mine for like certain things that I would see in Britain that I would have written off in America 10 years ago was something that didn't that I didn't need to be like watching or concerned about or or just a trend that that, that maybe some people hadn't spotted and and I, I kind of watch it for, for that reason as well I find it gives me like a, a really great perspective because they are like the culturally probably the two most important like political or like cultural forces at least um, Britain's definitely still like a serious economic force in the world, although obviously not on the sizes of America, but we're, we're still like fifth or sixth in the world um, in terms of GDP. So uh, I feel like there, there's, there's so much in common that can be looked at and, and so many similarities that can be drawn. And, and I kind of I sort of highlighted some of those in my book, actually, um, that it's the, there's a lot of similarities culturally in what's going on and the fact that that we live in this internet age means that those trends tend to sort of or at least i believe pass across the atlantic or or throughout the whole world faster than they would have um you know in previous generations you know i mean when you say that the funny thing is i always look at the uk and other countries in a similar fashion so I would look at what's happening in the U.S. And I mean, as somebody who w was in political consulting, I've gotten to the point where it's exhausting for, for me. It's just it, it's so repetitive and you begin to see where it's 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 cyclical after a while. And it's just it, it's it, like you said, theater that seems uh, I've gotten to the point where I've, I've begun to, to disengage rather than become mm. more engaged. Um, but I've I've started looking at other countries and seeing how you think you have one particular type of president, but then wait a minute, this same type of president is in five or six other countries, and what they're experiencing is exactly the same, and you start seeing these these cycles. So I don't want to get into it too much, but you also as far as my own perspective, but what also I noticed on your own site, the gist was your interest in international politics, but political messaging, and then the role that online marketing and bias and clickbait kind of intersect. Can you talk about that for a minute? Because I'm wondering, when I saw that on your website, I wanted to know where is he going with this? So essentially, like the point that I make in my book um, is that we have this this unbelievable, unfathomable quantity of data that is being constantly pumped out by all our actions online, and and the majority of those interactions happen on a handful of websites now. Like the the internet began as a really decentralized thing, but um, as it's uh, developed and whatnot like mo most of our time online is spent on google on facebook on on twitter on instagram on like a handful of sites and they are just hoovering up like information about how we interact online and most most importantly like how to sell us a product how to sell us an idea how to sell us anything uh the there's five years ago or six years ago they they were already doing studies um on how your Facebook likes can be could be mapped onto like really really old but really in depth personality models, um, the yes. ocean graph for example. Yeah. And like that was that was a few years ago, and and this technology is not getting dumber. <laughs> Put it that yeah. way. Like it's it's going to be getting in, like smarter and smarter and smarter as we just like feed it more and more and more information about how to sell us a product. Like everything we do, if we stop while scrolling on an ad, that's logged. If we even just ignore it altogether, that's logged. That's one way not to sell us it. It's kind of like the, the Edison thing, you know, he didn't find uh, 10,000 ways, um, 10, he didn't fail 10,000 times, he found 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb. Right. You know, it's, and, and with, with the, 
the amount of computing power and and understanding of of humanity it's it's only like a matter of time before that is used to sell us more than the next holiday we're going to go on or some weight loss pills you know it's it's used to sell us political ideas whether that's for our own benefit to try and sell us an idea that we should be in support of to try and sell us an idea that we should be against and it's not necessarily even always coming from the from someone who hopes to gain your support it's coming from bad actors who want to turn people against each other um some some of the things that that russian trolls uh did during the uh 2016 gen uh, election in america was to schedule like to organize little groups of say like black lives matter supporters and like blue lives matter supporters and then get the little facebook group and then organize an event right across the street from each other on the same day um in order to make them fight uh so like like this this technology is is so unbelievably powerful in in the way it shapes our world like we do like i don't honestly believe that anyone has a real grasp on just how much influence it can have on on our, our on our daily lives on like our society on our culture from like everything from the top to the bottom and and I think we, we really need to like recognize that because it's it's a terrifying, terrifying amount of power for like a handful of billionaires to have. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. Um, we're coming closer every day, it feels, to the or Orwell's dystopian reality. I mean, if you don't look at the date and just look at the specific content of 1984, what did he possibly articulate in his book that has not come to pass or isn't being worked on right now? I would say it's very prescient, very, very accurate. Uh, let me ask you, when you see the current state of international politics, um, what do you see as the current state, I should say, in this post-COVID, post-Trump, time right now are we post covid post trump where do you see things heading is it go to going toward becoming more polarized uh with us versus them as you kind of illustrated before you know with the blue lives mm -hmm. matter versus black lives matter clearly there's a difference between the two groups of course blue lives are they're not smurfs you know, there are human beings who put on a blue uniform. So you're equating that with people who have a certain level of pigmentation from birth who can't, you know, take it off. So is it, are, are we becoming more polarized, do you think? Um, you know, divide and conquer, is that what's taking place? Or is it less, less organized and less deliberate? I mean, if... If you to really ask me, I would say that it is divide and conquer. Um, it's uh, it's very easy to stir people up, and and like I mentioned, the the internet is fantastic at doing that, even when it's not deliberate. I mean, um, some some of the phenomenon that's been like heavily written about, and and I talk about in my book um, online, are the idea of uh, like filter bubbles and echo chambers, where you're only hearing um, ideas from within your own side, or when you do hear ideas from like outside your little bubble then it's caricatured and and sort of dismissed immediately and it's like denigrated uh, in a way that, that that makes you like caricature the other side as well and it just leads to just as far as i can see thus far just like ever increasing polarization and it's really hard not to get a little bit like despondent sometimes when you see it yeah. because you know so, so it's it's um like there's there's a case in in britain at the minute um that's that's drawn a lot of attention it was um a woman who was uh murdered by a a police officer or um, mm. yeah um and anyway so there was a, a vigil held um in like her her memorial at, um, or in her memory and uh the police came in and, and arrested some of the people at it because it was illegal under the covid rules and um there's been a, a, a police bill a policing bill that was in parliament but has now been shelved um temporarily at least 
that would have like given the police a lot more powers to clamp clamp down on protests, like even just peaceful protest. And there was uh, this moment where, because for the last year, a lot of people on the right in Britain had been uh, talking about how how easily we'd given up our our rights uh, during this this pandemic, like our rights to protest, to free assembly. So to, there's a lot there's a lot of them that have kind of just just uh, disappeared. I mean, like you you can vary on your you know disagreement or agreement with whether that was necessary or not, but like the reality is they they were gone for a while. Um, and there was a lot of people on the right, at least in, in Britain, saying, hey, look, we need to like, we need to be careful, like the right to protest is a really, really important right. We shouldn't yeah. be giving that up so easily. And now there's this moment where all of the left who were who, who were all very, very much in, in favor of this vigil, um, protest gathering, whatever you want to call it, and um, have seen what is coming in this policing bill and went, oh, hang on a second. Like we need, we need the right to protest, which right. like we can't we can't have that taken away. It's not that they forgot that, but I mean I think it's been like refreshed and and it's very clear in their mind in this moment. And this should be the ultimate moment, right, where all of the people come together and say, "Hey, we all want the same thing here. We want to like enshrine the right to protest and show that that's not up to up for debate. Like that that has to stay regardless of of anything else." And instead, they're all just fighting each other about little snitty points and um, mm. people being hypocrites because they're all on Twitter making yeah. it worse. <laughs> I, I think I think from my perspective, and, and, and I want your take on this, of course, I mean, there's two different points to me is one, you have people protesting during a global pandemic. Now, you could say it's just as bad as the flu or something, but no flu season in history has killed over 500,000 people. So do they have the right to protest? Well, absolutely. To me, that's a, it's a non-issue. Of course they do, but it's a matter of how do you protest safely so that you don't spread this this virus and give it more more sustenance. I mean, there, there, had, there had been a big thing where um, they that's went one. The, they went to the local government, the local council, to to get them to do it with them, so it was like COVID safe as such. Yeah, and uh, they said no, it's up to the police at the moment because of the power that the police had. And then the police said no, uh, we, we don't want to do this it at all. Um, yeah. uh, the, and then the police were accused of saying no because of the the case being that it was a police officer. Um, who, had, who had killed the woman. And uh, so then the, the people went and did it anyway because they said the police weren't being legitimate. But I, like my, the, the policing bill as well was, was part of this where they were gonna forever take away the right to protest. This wasn't like a temporary measure that was going through. It was gonna be passed into law um, and giving the police more power to, take, to, uh, to shut down protest um, because of some things like uh, the Extinction Rebellion protests that happened um, in in london last year that shut down some roads um and some people uh, glued themselves to the front of the, the the london stock exchange to stop people getting inside that was funny. yeah so you yeah it, i think there's a middle ground there where i i think protest is good i think it's important but how do you do it in a manner that's safe dirt you know so that covid doesn't keep going forever and, and I mean, just keep like, claiming more and more. And that's part one. The other part to the to the point is: Are you familiar with Kitty Genovese? Uh, I'm not. This the story of Kitty Genovese. I remember hearing about this a long, long time ago, and it really made a mark on me. Um, I don't remember the specific dates, but it's an old story. It goes way back, and I remember hearing about it quite some time ago. I'd have to look it up in Wikipedia to get the exact dates. But this was in New York City, and there was a woman named Kitty Genovese. I don't remember what the whole story was. She was coming home or something or going to work. And um, if you see it, let me know. But she was basically attacked by a man who was beating her and raping her. And people were walking by and just staring. Some people oh, were yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the bystander so, effect. Yeah. So some people kept walking. Some people would stop and just stare with their mouths agape, unsure what to do. And it went on for quite some time. 
And it wasn't until finally one man said, hey, what are you doing? And he didn't do, I don't think he fought with the man or anything. He just acted like he was going to engage. And the man stopped beating her and stopped raping her, I guess, and took off. And she eventually died from all the wounds and and all the all that she had suffered. But I remember hearing the story and thought, my God, it's such a powerful story. If all it took was one person to just engage a little bit, you don't even have to get into a physical altercation with the person. Just act as though what you're doing is not acceptable. Leave her alone. I'll, I'll take out my phone and call 911 or something. Just do something to get engaged so you're not just passively there. But I always was struck how, how powerful that was, how this poor woman could have been saved. You know, if someone had just acted a few minutes earlier, you know. So when I think about, you know, protesting and, you know, I'm 100% I'm behind the power of protest, but I also can understand, hey, I don't want to get COVID. We don't want, you know, another person to die from it unnecessarily. And, you know, if you Google long COVID, there's a lot of people getting it who aren't, you know, getting it and dying right away. You know, they end up losing a lung or or it's a long drawn out thing. What I always say to people is, can you afford to get COVID? If you're in the U.S., we don't have a, a national health care service like you do in the U.K. So if you get COVID and you go to the hospital, you could be bankrupt. It could, you'd, you'd have to, you could go through who knows what to have to pay these hospital bills. If you're in there for a week or a month, God help you. So there's all of this complication to it. But I definitely, you know, if you can't protest, how can you become more engaged? So it's kind of like, what's the middle ground for that? I mean, I you guess, know, again, the, po the, the point, the, the point that they, the, was that like the the policing bill was yeah give it it was it was going to take it away permanently it wasn't just during covid mm. times um and so like my point was that they were all they should have been united but because of the internet and the fantastic way in which they we just seem to fall into two tribes over everything uh it means that that we we well for now we've managed to defeat it but it means that we're far less united on issues where we should be you know, that the, yeah. there's, there's things that, you know, you were saying that, like, sometimes you're checking out a little bit um, and, and like the thing that like, happens to me, too, sometimes. And you know what brings me back every single time is the words of Bernie Sanders. He says, never lose your sense of outrage. And I really try to live yeah. by those words. Like I can I can like calm myself down or if I get really mad or I can like just be like like try like check out or just like be like cynical about things but like you shouldn't lose that that sense that 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 sense of outrage and there are like i said there are things that we should be united on like bernie sanders platform like agree with some of his stuff or not the vast majority of his platform was supported by like 60 percent plus of americans that 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 should it shouldn't that shouldn't like be something that one man has to fight for that's no, I would. Done I would already when 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 the majority of people support something and have done for a while. It's not like this is new, newly found. Do you know, what I mean, these like the things that he's campaigning are not attitudes that people have changed that much on. Or I don't think anyway. Yeah. So I, I yeah. The, we we end up fighting each other on on from like two. We've got the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. You guys got Republicans, the Democrats. We just fight each other when we should be united against the people that are you know, taking away our, 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 um, our well, our, at the minute, our rights, um, quite, quite often, uh, the, the financial viability of our, our nations when, when they're, and, and just being corrupt and handing out uh, contracts to people that, the, that are donating large sums of money to them. You know, there's, there's so many things that we could, we could fight on if we weren't fighting each other. Yeah, I mean, if you look at what Bernie Sanders was trying to do as a candidate, and you really look at it from the American perspective, it was actually a very forward thinking agenda, where what did he want to do? You know, let's get some kind of national health care service like every other major industrialized country has. Uh, let's try to make it easier for working class people to go 
to work and try to level the playing field. And really, to me, it wasn't that radical. But I think when it was you, you had that agenda and then you had TV channels like CNN being very dismissive of him as if he were just, so, you know, some old crackpot. But then you had on the right side, you had Fox News saying, you know, this is dangerous. It's socialism, you know. So for people, I think when it came to finally come out and vote for him, the people who really put forth his agenda the most, younger people and progressive people in the U.S., basically, they didn't show up in enough numbers for no. him to really win that candidacy, you mm. know. And know, so well, now I'm, we end up I'm with a centrist. With story. I've, I've several yeah, stories yeah. Behind me, um, uh, but like, again, like my my point my point my point remains that his agenda is is largely popular and has been for a long time, and it should not be just one man putting forward that popular an agenda when. Like the theory is, at least in a democracy, that the popular things should be done. And you know, if 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 a pol if a policy has more than than fifty percent support from from the pop from the population, then theoretically that's what should happen. Like in a democracy, perhaps like two thirds majority if you're if it's something really big. But you know, and and if that isn't the case. Then you have to look at what's going on. I mean, the, there's a there's a fantastic video. I think was it was by Vox um, on their YouTube channel, and it must have been about ten years ago now. But it was called like the most the most depressing chart in America, and it was a, a like a, a graph in which they charted um, the the policies that were implemented in in America by the government versus like how popular they were with the public. And right. There was zero correlation between how popular a certain policy was and if it was um, enacted. And then when they corrected it for what donors had been, you know, in favor of, then it became far more obvious who was, you know, dictating the playing field here in 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 national politics. And that's a trend that that is only accelerated by the internet when it's like hyper feeding. This this tribal nature of ours. I mean, like, what's this? Mm, I think that's a 16, very good point. 17, 16, 17 years old. Like, you, uh, have things got more or less crazy since then? You know, have things got more or less polarized since all of this technology came into our life? It, it's not a trend that is going all over the place. The longer we have had it, the more polarized we are becoming. And I don't think that's a coincidence. How do you feel that the media as a whole, let's say globally or influences what we perceive and consume in our daily reality that we that we're living through? Because it seems that certainly based on what you just said, the genie's out of the bottle. Yeah, I mean, when you say media, do you mean like traditional media? Like the like the the CNNs, the New York Times is like that. Is that what you mean? Like like just just so I know what you mean. I mean it as a whole. I just mean it as the monolith. Uh, but I suppose yeah, you would have to say in the U.S. you have CNN, which is probably center left. Then you have Fox News to the right, but not as extreme as something like OAN one america news which to me is kind of so to the right that it's almost on the you know falling off the table and you know to the and further left you probably have what is there that's further left in cnn maybe uh, the young turks maybe um yeah, yeah, well, yeah I'm I mean, not I mean it, dep it depends how how niche you want to go i mean there's a lot of people further yeah. left than the young than than the young turks i mean the Young Turks become increasingly corporate. Um, that's probably what happens when you blow up. Um, they like taking, yeah. Yeah, and, and you may consume more media than I do. You may be aware of more sites I mean, too. I could say Vox is probably more left wing than than Vox. Fairly, yeah, Vox is fairly left wing. Um, 
I mean, further left, you would say probably is uh, Jimmy Dore. Um, he's fairly he's pretty popular these days. Um, who else we got? MSNBC is our center. Um, I'm trying to think what your other major networks are. New York Times is probably left now. Washington Post will be left. See, it's become it's become quite polarized though. It's it's like I don't, yeah. I, 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 don't, I hate the idea of of like a newspaper as being ideologically driven. I don't I don't I like I, I, to me that's just like conflicting with the whole point. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean it seems like. Do you think is 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 our is most of the world in a similar? state is the US and the UK where it's so polarized that it's us versus them because if I look at the UK you may have more political parties than we do in the US but in the US we have a green party that's more left but they never run candidates who ever have a prayer of winning mm. so it's almost like and if you want to volunteer for them you couldn't if you wanted to is it so you basically have a Republican and, and Democratic Party, there's other ones, but they don't really do anything to be taken seriously, whether that's by choice or by circumstance. Is that similar in the UK? Do you see that as happening in most other countries? If I look at Brazil, you've got Bolsonaro, who is just like Trump. If you look at Mexico, you've got uh, a left leaning type Bolsonaro of guy. Very popular, very popular. Who is? Bolsonaro, the, the Brazilian guy, is very popular. And the, and the thing is, if you look at what's happening in Brazil right now, as of, uh, what is it, March 23rd now, if you look at what's happening in Brazil with COVID, it looks like it's pretty out of control. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked. I've been, I I've mean, been, I've, I've had my head down in, in, uh, in a lot of writing. Um, but like your original question was uh, about how much control I think the media has um, about like influencing what's going on. I think they have a much bigger control than we even realize. Um, I, I know a lot, it's really popular for a lot of people to talk mm. about uh, like the death of, of like the mainstream media or the, the lamestream media. <laughs> um, and like the people talking about the death of print and the death of newspapers and everything. But you know what? what they say still drives like all of the conversations that we have about about media it doesn't I, matter that no one's watching they're watching that five minute clip that again gets like talked about on all like say say someone goes on on cnn or the young turks and says something really really outrageously stupid right or at least something outrageously stupid to the right then all of the right wing um uh, like youtubers commentators everything they'll immediately comment on whatever that 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 comment or whatever the original comment was right. blows up so the, the the coverage by these major networks still drives a lot of the conversation that we have and it's still the thing that people hear and see and like think oh that's well that's the new york times or oh that's cnn they're saying that that must be the news and i think it's it might seem like maybe the mainstream press is dying a little and, and and losing their grip um yeah i know what you that's mean only amongst that's only amongst the the the, the ones that are, the people that are really engaged it's not amongst like the, the your average person who, who just wants you know to, to to find out what's going on for a minute or two in the world and then go back to their life you know like everyone's not like so drilled into it as as i like, say we are all the time um mm. and, and therefore i think they they still have a huge influence um, so I, it's, I think it's difficult to underestimate it, at least. And to at least some extent, do you think it's what's happening is intentional? In terms of the, the, the division? Yeah, because you see th that in almost every country, it seems to be a much more pronounced uh, confrontational mm -hmm. division. I then mean, I, I I recall seeing maybe pre pre World War II. I, I don't know if that's a, we were, like it's really difficult to say because we just weren't there, you know. Yeah, but it does seem like it's definitely become more polarized mm -hmm. than it was ten years ago. 
And I mean, do you think that there's like an intentional effort to say, look, if we divide, we can do more. I remember reading a long time ago that there was something called Project Mockingbird that was declassified. So it's not a conspiracy theory. This was something that, that's real, that actually did happen. They declassified it. You can look it up on Wikipedia or Google it. There's news reports. They had to testify before the Senate that it turned out there were people within the intelligence industry who were working at uh, the major networks. Hmm. No, I Promo am familiar, I'm familiar with the, with, the, with the story and they were feeding the yeah. stories and just saying, sign this is yours and put it on. Yeah, I mean, I, I think- I wonder there, what's going on. I think there's, there's two things going on. I think that, or well, okay, there's three things going on. First okay. of all, there's things like you said, like Operation Mockingbird. I would be seriously, 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 seriously surprised if something along those lines was not still going on. Whether that's going straight to like the New York Times or whether that's like disseminating things online, um, you know, say claiming to be someone inside the government, um, dropping information about the secret war going on and calling yourself Q and telling people about the crazy things that, you know, the crazy secret plan, you know, I would be really surprised. I'm not saying that that's definitely a government project. I'm saying right. we don't want to get their attention anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, <laughs> I'm saying that I'd be really surprised if the, if the intelligence agencies weren't still doing something like that, whether that's like exactly what it was or something like internet based that's like that. Then there's the effect that social media has on polarizing us anyway, just because of the way it is written to feed us what keeps us engaged, to feed us. Um, yeah, I think that that's a large part. Watching. And that's, that's a huge part of it. And then I think that there probably is like a fairly concerted effort amongst who I can't say exactly because that's like very difficult to sort of pinpoint but people that, that benefit from the, the country being divided whether that's like media moguls who like people tuning in for the culture war whether that's uh politicians who would rather people were fighting hard against each other in order for them to get re-elected whether that's oil groups who would rather, you know, they had at least one side of the aisle behind them because, you know, free enterprise and doesn't matter that you're like completely ruining places when you go in with like highly, you know, impactful extractive techniques for oil or gas or things like fracking, for example. So like there's, there's always going to be funny, going to be reasons for people with enough power and influence to use that influence to, you know, help themselves out and i think it ends up being a combination of all three of those that that mean um we we may be screwed basically mm -hmm. <laughs> well i have about three more questions for you and i want to get your take on some other points do you think that the internet and then secondly social media should be regulated and if yes where would where do you begin and then where do you end you know what i mean how where do you want to if you're going to regulate it to what extent i have been thinking a lot about this recently um the first place i would probably start is to say that I personally believe that we should be banning all political advertising online. Um, in the UK, uh, 30 or 40 years ago, we decided that we did not want political advertising on TV, or it would be basically confined to party political broadcasts, and uh, that would be it. We don't have the same kind of ads that you you have in America. You know, it comes up with the flag waving in the air. Like, and you don't have drug commercials either, I don't think, do you? No, no, we don't. Not really. Like with some, like like I don't know, like like cough syrup and stuff like that. But that's basically yeah. It. Um, but so yeah, so we decided as a country that we didn't think that those were good ideas for for the political ads. We thought the well, the theory was at least that politics belongs on the doorstep. You're the success of your campaign should not be based on how many political ads you can buy. It should be based on how many people you can convince to come with you and go knocking on doors 
in the evening on that rainy Saturday morning before the polls. The, 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 the amount of people you can get to go out and believe in your cause and try and help you. That's like what politics should be built on, right? And we decided that it shouldn't be because you can pay for ads on TV. And except now we've got the ability to pay for ads from behind a laptop screen that are way more intelligent, way more tailored and micro targeted to your exact personality or preferences or, or, or uh, content that you tend to consume online. And, and we've just sort of let that go. And that's terrifyingly powerful. And, and I just believe that the, the best way is to just say, nope, we're not going to have that. I, I, I don't think, mm. I think we've, we've done it before with other mediums. And I think it's totally possible. That's not saying that you can't say whatever you want. That's not like trying to infringe on people's freedom of speech. That's like, you know, you can still have your political like Twitter page or you can have your, your uh, you know, you, you can have your Facebook page for your uh, political party and you can say there whatever you want. If your supporters like it, they can share it as much as they want. Right. But you can't pay to be louder. And that's that's. That's where we'd probably start with with uh, with regulating social media. Yeah, I know in the U.S. they've been this, the back and forth struggle to get money out of politics has been going on for decades now, and it just seems like every political cycle it seems to be escalated that the candidates need more and more capital in order to make it to the capital. Um, so it becomes more and more exacerbated, but by removing money from politics, if you could do it, then they have no motivation to really run for office except to be public servants. Which, Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> it's unimaginable right now. Yeah. Um, let me ask you two more questions I've got for you. What's the path forward toward a more rational less manipulated internet um should we have an international or global bill of rights who would put that forth how would it work practically what's your take on that um i think you probably have to try and let countries decide unfortunately that's going to be really difficult for social media firms especially ones that want to be international at least but I, I kind of feel like they're probably capable of doing it. Uh, they, they have location services turned on. They're tracking our location all the time. Why couldn't they tailor whatever the, whatever's possible to you know, the location we're in? Um, so that's, that's, that's where I kind of stand on that. Um, in terms of how we get away from like a, or how we get to like a less manipulated um, social media I kind of feel like a more decentralized type of social media is probably the, the healthier way, at least anyway. Um, if you think back to like the MySpace days where, you know, before you have this timeline that would just feed you like the content that you, mo that you wanted to see most, you right. to go to someone's page to, to see what they had to say. Um, and there's like a few different things sort of, out and about that are sort of getting built up on this. There's uh, pockets, uh, there's locals, and and they're, they're just trying to like decentralize the the structure of social media in a way that it's like you go to someone's page to see their mm. thing, um, but that's it. Like you don't have like a feed of it. You just have like a, like pages you can go to. And, and for me, that feels like a much healthier way because one of the most like, I don't know, predatory aspects of, of social media is the feed um, yeah it's this it's this little dopamine like driven um piece of addictive perfection really no i i agree <laughs> with you I, I i agree with you as someone who is online a lot it's actually annoying because if i look at facebook or linkedin well not even linkedin but if i look at facebook it shows me comments or the latest comments from people in different groups now the thing is i don't always want to see that i just i just want to see what's you know uh what's going on in different groups but not necessarily what everyone has to say or what they had for breakfast or some you know nonsensical thing like that 
So yeah, what you, what you're saying is very true. They're trying to create like a hermetically sealed environment. So I only see what the last thing I saw was. So it perpetuates this blinders perception of the world, which is very limiting and kind of stultifying in a way. Um, let me ask you as just a final question, as far as chatter and the gist go, when people consume the podcast or look at the website, what do you want them? And I know that they're two separate entities, so bear with me. What do you want them to come away with? I mean, what's the onus of them individually so that you can say, me as Josh, I want you to to look at the world through this lens or something else completely different. So if I look at the gist, for example, I look at it and go, this person's really into global politics. He seems extremely informed, really, really in intrigued with, what, with what's going on politically around the world. That piques my interest. But what's his general uh, world view? What's he really trying to express? What do you want it to do? Um, well, I guess I would like people to, to, to always be willing to, to consider a different side of things. Um, I feel like we've lost the ability to talk to each other and, and to, to kind of figure, try and figure things out from, from like a calm and uh, reasonable look at things. And, and I, I'd like people to stop getting so caught up in, in their bubbles basically. And, and I try to, to talk about lots of different issues and, and explore things that I find interesting. And, and most of all, I try to talk to people from, from all kinds of like different perspectives. Like I've, I've had um, everyone from, from people who like complete, like total and other like sworn up communists all the way to people who were at the January 6th March uh, uh, at the Capitol. Uh, I've had all like all, that entire spectrum of views <laughs> and everything in between, and and I, I feel like there's always I, I've learned something from each and every one of them. Um, I've had my opinion changed on a few things, and uh, I'd like people to you know at least just just go in with an open mind and think you know maybe someone else that doesn't have to be me necessarily could teach me something that I didn't I didn't think about. So if you were for the sake of example, if you were to look at this um, election coming up, I don't know the specific date in Ecuador, which I think is very interesting. You had basically, I, I don't know what the runoff is, but you have three candidates. One is an indigenous gentleman who is left-leaning. And if there's an Ecuadorian who I am offending, please forgive me. Obviously, I'm not a totally up to, to what's going on there. But I know that they have an indigenous gentleman who is more toward the left. Then you have a centrist gentleman who is a banker, I believe. And then you have another person who is a little bit more to the right. So would it be fair to say on the gist, you would want to profile all three and try to give them equal uh voice or would you say no i mean i'd probably i'd probably try and give it like it would depend it's a on... rhetorical question <laughs> i mean yeah it would depend on what was going on but like i i would love to to try i i think the third candidate would probably in my in if for example i put this on my site be the one that would be the most interesting because they would be the person who would pull votes from one of the other two and would end up potentially being the one that decided the race. So, um, yeah, I guess that's a great analogy, actually. You always got to look at the thing you're not considering. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's very, very interesting. I'm not sure how it's going to turn out, but I have a feeling that the, um, the left, the more left leaning person will win. But, um, which is interesting I, I, because, because, um, I expected all of the post COVID elections to go right. Um, because there's this uh, really intriguing phenomenon 
where the more infectious diseases, um, like the coast yard to the equator, the more infectious diseases tend to be in your country. And the higher that like chance, the more likely the government is to be right wing on average. So there's this weird mm. thing. So like places where there's a lot of disease, for some reason, tend to lean right or more right than the rest of the world. And yeah. I had this idea that maybe that would mean that post COVID, we would all have this desire for, uh, I don't know, a right wing government. <laughs> It, it does seem that countries that where COVID has more of a foothold, where it's spread much more, that they had more right-leaning mm -hmm. leaders with Bolasarno um, in Brazil, uh, the gentleman in Mexico, but I guess he's more left-leaning. So that's not fair, but I mean, and I'm just, spe I'm just speculating. Look at like France, Spain, Italy. Um, yeah, you're more informed on, on international Canada. politics than I am, certainly. Yeah, it, it, it does seem like there's something going on there. And I think in the U.S., I think it was a case of more people coming out to vote and saying, we need to get this COVID under control. And... Mm -hmm denying it or minimizing it or trying to put a pretty bow on it isn't helping anyone. So we need someone who's going to be at least a little bit more pragmatic, you know, even if he's a I mean, centrist. Trump then, then, then Trump got like an extra 10 million votes as well. So I'm not sure that that theory holds up. Well, yeah, he did get more votes uh, than re any Republican candidate, but then Biden, I just mean got... like compared to his last, compared to his last, um, election, like he, gave yeah, like, no, you're absolutely election. right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. He did. Uh, but then to my memory, B Biden got something like 5 million more than Trump. So yes, Trump historically did get more Republican votes than anyone previously had. So he has the right to crow about that and brag about that. But Biden won by like 5 million, which is still more than enough to push him over the edge. And I think that was primarily because more people just felt like we, we've got to get this under control. Now, if we had not had COVID, what would have happened then? I think Trump would have won 100%. Probably. Probably, probably. I mean, I, I think I think a lot of people on the left in America need to seriously, seriously, seriously think about this for the next three years. Think about nothing else than you threw everything at Donald Trump. Like you literally threw everything at him. Some of it, a lot of it, deserved. Um, but they they threw they threw everything at the kitchen sink at the man. Like he was like enemy number one across all of the, the, the left-wing news networks or most of the media to be honest um he was like the person persona non grata with anyone um and and he got 10 million more votes than the last time like he threw he was the, the focus of four years of hatred and he got 10 million more votes like ask yourself why that's and i think i i think that's the million dollar question uh, and I think that's a very, very valid point. So before I go crazy into politics, and I'm probably very transparent to everyone. So before we, before I jump into that, uh, I'll just tie it up there. But I want to thank you very much for your time and uh, for your thoughts, Josh. Uh, please tell everyone where they can learn more about your own podcast and your own website as well, so they can learn more. Well, you get the podcast on the website. So if you want to see any of it, you can go to www.thegist, that's J-I-S-T dot C-O dot U-K. And uh, yeah, the podcast there, everything I write is there. And yeah, that's all. You, uh, that's where you find all my stuff. You can follow me on Twitter as well. Um, and that's also, you'll find the link on the website and I will send you the link if you want to put it in the description or something, David. Well, I absolutely uh, appreciate your time, Josh, and I want to thank anyone for listening or watching. And Josh, uh, please stick around for another minute or two. And 
Uh, take care, everyone, until the next episode. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.